Hello, everyone. We are back. It feels so good to be back. We're back for our third season of Watch House. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, if you guys aren't aware, Watch House is a show put on by thegamehouse.com, the site that all of uh, the four lovely writers here are uh, members of. Um, and we break down weekly um, Overwatch League analysis. We do, um, we've done different things in the past, but this show is about power rankings specifically, our TGH staff, preseason power rankings. We're going to get into what that is in a second, but first we need to introduce who you're looking at on, on camera here. So the man who just put on some fresh glasses, <laughs> Shy Guy, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, I am Bradley Shy Guy Long. Uh, I am a tier three caster and the uh, Atlanta Rain beat writer for thegamehouse.com. Great nice. website. Oh, great website, by the way. Um, Sybil. Hey, hi, everyone. My name is Kate Sybil Shepard. I'm the former Fusion and Paris Eternal um, beat writer, but now I focus on Contenders coverage. Yes, the queen of contenders is what we we have dubbed Kate. Um, and then Mallory, what's up? Hello, I am Mallory. Hello. I've written for basically every single team that has existed in the Overwatch League. Fair. Right now, I'm writing about the Toronto Defiant. Uh, in the past, though, I've written for Boston, Valiant, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Shanghai, etc. Amazing. Our jack of all trades. You're gonna have all the perspectives for this power ranking show. Quite literally, almost every team. Yeah. Uh, my name is Connor Knutson, Goopy Knoopy, as you may otherwise know me as. Um, I do just kind of some general Overwatch League writing for the game house, as well as covering some other games and esports um, in the in the in the realm of games and esports. So that's us. This is the gang. This is our Watch House crew for 2020. We're also going to be joined rotationally, kind of week in, week out, by a few different members. You'll meet them soon enough, probably in the next two weeks or so. So stay tuned for that. But Right now, we got to stay in the present here. We got to talk about our preseason power rankings. I'm going to quickly break down what exactly we're doing here and what the scroller at the bottom of the screen means. Um, so, our article just went out, it just released. This is the Game House staff's TGH uh, preseason power rankings. This is an aggregate cumulative power rankings that were voted on by all the contributors, uh, Overwatch League contributors at thegamehouse.com. So, this is all of our rankings put together. It doesn't necessarily represent any one ranking of any member of the show. Um, it's instead everyone's kind of put together in the, the lump sum. The average rating for each team is what we have. And that's what you're seeing on the bottom slider, or as well as what you'd read about more in the article. So what we're going to do is quickly kind of go through all 20 of these teams, talk about the rankings, um, where they've fallen. Again, this may not be where any of us rank these teams, so we may have some different perspectives on how we rated them and, and where they fall and maybe getting into the minds of some of the writers who have done this in the past. So without further ado, we're just going to jump right into it. At number 20, the Boston Uprising. And speaking of our, our Boston Up, you know, our writer that's covered all the teams, uh, she's recently covered Boston. Mallory, what do you think about Boston at 20? All right, listen. <laughs> listen. <laughs> I am of the constant faith that Boston is one of those teams you really just don't know what's going to happen until you see it on stage. Last season, everybody had Boston really, really low as well. And the first weekend they come out, they bring NYXL to a tie in one of their games. And that's NYXL, you know, a team that pretty much has always been consistently good. So, I mean, it's fair for everybody to be this skeptic, especially since they've lost a lot of big names. Like, you know, no more Blase, yeah. um, RCK is gone, Aim God is finally gone and onto a different team. And I think the, the like, one shining hope that a lot of fans have still uh, rests in Fusions. Mm. Um, he's just, he's good at what he does in terms of leadership. Um, he's, you know, maintained a really good energy um, among the team. And yeah. it, it makes sense that they're ranked this low because there's a lot of people that we don't really know a lot about until we'll see them on stage, um, like Jerry yeah. um, and like Mung Bong. Yep. Um, but the anticipation for people like Swimmer has been, you know, for people who have been waiting for Swimmer and Owl for a year. <laughs> so um, I don't know. I think they're going to surprise everybody. I don't know if they're going to make it all the way to the grand finals. It's like a cursed <laughs> sentence that I said earlier that made kate lose her mind but fair 
Cater Brad, any I, other any other thoughts on on the Boston Uprising for 2020? I think that is about right. Um, yeah. You know, the the one kind of player that I think could really come out and kind of surprise people and was probably like the their most hyped up signing of the the, the off season was Myungbong. Uh mm-hmm. that dude is is going to be really good. He was pursued by a lot of teams. Boston got their first, uh which was huge for them. Mm-hmm. Uh he could carry them to a, a few victories, but you know, th- there's a reason that they they find themselves at 20. Yeah. Yeah, I think the consensus that I've seen among a lot of analyst ratings are that these bottom two teams are kind of it's just you flip a coin for whoever you have at the bottom. I've seen very few teams have a different team besides Boston or the Valiant at 20. It's very interesting that the community has kind of agreed on this being the bottom tier when some other teams have completely, you know, shut their rosters as well. It's an interesting thing. So that kind of leads us into number 19, um, is, is the LA Valiant, which, Mallory, you're getting another up right away, another team you've covered. Um, talk to us a little bit about the Valiant. Uh, why do you have them above Boston, or what are your thoughts? Oh boy. Or do you? All right. To... Yeah. Well, in my personal rankings, I had the Valiant last. Okay. Um, not hard feelings, but Same. with the Valiant, the skepticism for me is a lot more understandable because they literally gutted their team of all of their all stars. You know, Cust is gone, Space is gone, Kriv is gone, Agilities is gone. And then what was left afterwards before they announced any signings was KSF and mm. Shax. And you, that, that's like a hard thing to build a team off of, especially with fans of the Valiant who have stuck around since season one who like Custa, Agilities, and Kariven, this team that they've been cultivating for two years. Um, they're bringing in like a lot of unknowns, a lot of, you know, like low tier talent that I don't really have a lot of faith in. Um, I don't. I don't think it's going to go very well for them. As after the season they had last year, you, 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 this is not the direction you want to go in. And I don't really have a lot of faith that Valiant's really going to ever make it out of this bottom five. That's fair. I think that's fair. Uh, Kate or Brad, again, any other kind of counter thoughts, um, things to add to this assessment? I, th- I think the saving grace here for Valiant is. is probably kind of the the coaching staff i i am a big believer in packing tin especially after what he did yeah. after coming in last season uh their their turnaround kind of aligned right with him taking over the the head coaching spot and i think if there's anybody who's going to be able to take a, a team of unknowns and mold them into something competitive uh, it's going to be that guy so you know that that's, yeah, that's the one point. thing that that i think they have really going for them here um, but I, I, I still see this as going to be a, a rough season for the Valiant. They're going to have a, a big learning curve with a lot of new players. I will say, though, that I do think that two of their pickups, especially Gig and KSP, like, they're, those are two really, really good ones. Mm. And so, like, my thing, I also personally had the Valiant dead last just because with Boston, I feel like for love him or hate him, Huck, like, he has a he has a really good eye for spotting like diamonds in the rough. Mm. And so that gives them kind of a slight edge over them over me, but they're, it's still looking not good <laughs> for yeah. both teams. So, yeah, I agree. I, I think I have a very similar assessment as you all. I think the one boon for LA that we haven't quite touched on is that they are staying in LA. Um, this is a familiar place for them. I mean, they're playing at the Novo again. They've played there before. They likely keep a lot of their same facilities they've been using for the past two seasons, which I see is a, you know, a lot of these other teams are going to be, you know, handling a move to China or Korea or Canada. I mean, there's a lot of big moves coming up, and the Valiant completely dodged that. But when they also completely rebrand to where the team's unrecognizable, do you think people are going to show up? Because a lot yeah. of, like, diehard Valiant fans that I know, like, they're like, We're, I'm done. Yeah. Because they got Mallory. <laughs> yeah, it may, it may not help their fandom, just strictly for, like, hours in the week practicing. But, yeah, yeah. the rebrand I, is I its whole kind of... of... It's just a bit odd. Yeah. I understand, but that kind of brings us out of that bottom tier. Like I said, I think a lot of people have almost agreed that those two are the bottom. I have seen a few people, though, rate this next team at 20 as well, and that is the London Spitfire, who we have at 18 in our TGH rankings, Um, a team that is completely swapped. They cleaned house. They got rid of a team that won a championship in 2018. Brad, is this a – why has – why? What is going on with London? You know, I, I understand why they felt the need to kind of rebuild. If you look at how they performed last year, 
that team was just kind of a mess, and I, I think it was one of those situations that was a little bit unsalvageable just because uh, I think te the the team kind of devolved after winning that that first yeah. uh, you know title. The the expectations were so high, and when they they didn't immediately meet them, I I don't think they were prepared to kind of take stock and you know be able to to come back from that. So I understand why they moved on, and it it probably also had something to do with you know money concerns because let, let's let's be honest, they they sold off some really really high yeah. price players and they yeah. they brought in relative unknowns pretty mm -hmm. much across the board you know they've got one player who's ever really even you know or two players who have been in the overwatch league in in highly and krillin yeah. uh, and neither of them were were really kind of standouts in any way so it, it's it's kind of a, a team of unknowns but y you can spin that as a good thing if you're a on the spitfire fan you can you know try to to imagine that this team is is going to be kind of the the underdogs and, and build up to something great but with the rest of the league kind of taking steps forward this is the one team that like clearly 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 took a massive step back yeah i think that's absolutely right uh cater mallory any other thoughts on on london um aces honk <laughs> Burner is good, and y'all will see, and y'all will recognize, because I've seen a lot of weird <laughs> comments about him uh, not being good enough to make this roster, which is surprising to me, considering yeah, Burner played for Fusion University and was one of, if not, probably actually like their second best player under Alarm, yeah. most consistent. So y'all will see, and y'all will recognize, and y'all will love him. And if you don't, I will, <laughs> I will, I will find out. Kate will <laughs> make sure. Uh, and they all, do they have Glister as well, or is that a different team? They do. He is they not do. of age yes. just yet, I don't think. Um, so right. I'm not sure when. I'm not he sure actually... when he is either. Oh no! Oh, he actually turns 18 in like four days. Oh. So he's gonna be fine for the the start of the season, and you know that's a that's a, a big pickup for them for sure. Yeah. Well, happy early birthday, Glister, from here at all of us at the Watch House. Um, so yeah, I think that you know the consensus among these bottom three teams is that people are not confident. It seems like our writers are not confident in these teams based on the fact, probably primarily, that they traded their whole rosters away. I mean, there there are a lot of relative unknowns, a lot of contenders players in these teams. I would guess that the percentage of contenders players on these teams, the the ratio of them to the rest of our rankings is is much higher. So I think that is a common theme among our rankers at the site. Um, one thing I would say for London too that personally led me to ranking them lower, I actually think this team has a decently high ceiling, but their travel is just brutal. I think they have the worst travel of anyone in the league. I think it's like 76,000 miles or something um, estimated, which Washington Justice are at 21,000 for reference. That is insane. So um, I think those numbers will prove to mean a lot for them. This next team though, at 17, we have the Dallas Fuel. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about them because this team, to me, is one of the most interesting teams on this list and that they are probably the hardest to rank. Um, I think Dallas, at their best, if they can field a starting six, you know, week in, week out, and perform at their cap, I think they're among, I mean, they have a really good starting roster. They bring in some talent that I think are, are incredible additions in Doha and Decay and Gamsu. I think that's, that's kind of just what they needed. Um, however... On the flip side, I'm not sure they have kind of cleared that old guard out enough in order to have success in 2020. I think there's still, you know, I love these players. These are two of my personal favorite individual players and people in the league, but Trill and Zachary have no place in this team right now. It's just, it's tough for me to imagine them having success with players um, like that and like uh, Harry Hook still on the roster. So it's just, it's a tough thing to rate Dallas. I just don't know what they're going to do with, with all of this kind of old guard around. Anyone else have any counterpoints on that? There, there's a world in which the, those three new additions are, you know, they're, I think they're going to be in the lineup at all times. You know, that that is oh. going to be half of their starting six. And when you look at what the, the rest of that roster is going to be, you, you pair games who back with Note, um, who I personally have some, some doubts about going into this season. Um, but if you, there's a theoretical world where that pairing, you know, gets back to their, their glory days in Boston, you, you, you still have a, what was a, a decent support line in, in closer and unco. Yeah. And if all of that comes together, 
maybe they're like a middle of the pack team, uh, but the the ceiling is not super high to to me. That's fair. I think that's fair. Um, let's move right along. This this next team is another team that I think has had some disparity amongst our rankers. Um, I'm not I'm not on the article, so I'm not sure what the highest and lowest rank are for Paris, but um, at least in this group, I think there's some disparity with what we believe Paris will do in 2020. I want to hand it to Kate. Uh, Kate knows a lot about this Paris roster, is very familiar with the players. So, Kate, what are your thoughts going into 2020 about the Paris Journal? Um, okay, so a lot of people I've seen put them, like, probably where we have, like, the Spitfire yeah. or Dallas and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I personally have them at 14, and, like, they're very interchangeable. Like, my personal is, like, 10 through 15 is very interchangeable. Fair. Like, Paris was a disaster last season. They just were. I say that as lovingly as possible. They just, they never really got it together. They had a lot of issues with like, you know, going from Bayman to Fefe with coaching and like, they just never seemed to quite get it together. And then during the off season, they released, in my opinion, their best players in honor to keep things French. Yeah. So they have soon, they have Nico, they have Ben Best returning. And for me, that's kind of a big thonk. And then <laughs> they had, you know, um, a good chunk of element mystic players which is an all korean team and that this was a team that was marketed as being an all european team and so now they're going towards a mixed roster mm -hmm. and along with that they also have signed on coach rush who was element mystics head coach and they've also signed 9k who's coming in from the san francisco shop yeah last year a lot of people were talking about how paris has this great coaching staff and on paper they did and that was kind of like why people thought they were going to be good mm -hmm. i think this is for me, kind of why I'm believing them a, a bit more than other people is just because 9K has that experience yeah. uh, with mixed rosters. And then Element Pistic is a damn good Contenders yeah. Korea team. <laughs> yeah. And um, a lot of people like to be like, oh, well, Sparkle isn't going to be of age until May. Like, you know, he's not going to be able to play and he's going to be their carry. There's, there's other, they signed Han Ben and D and they're also very good. And like, I get people want to make, you know, Sparkle or Sprinkle, as we affectionately call him, like, you know, the star yeah. player, he's going to change everything. Every single time that mindset is applied to a team, that player does not do well. That's fair. <laughs> so you're putting a lot of expectation yeah. on this kid, which isn't fair. One, that's like a lot to put on someone's shoulders or on any player, just like to expect them to be the carry of this team. And it's also not fair to the players who are already there and working hard. Yeah. And people also aren't considering that Cruz is, you know, he has experience on, you know, a Korean team. And so he'll be able to like kind of be the new Bishu and like they're, they're working towards making this work. And so I have a little bit more faith in them than I think in most, but yeah, that's fair. This is, um, am I still there? I froze for me. No, you're good, you're good. Um, okay. For me, I think this is fair, but I think, you know, maybe have a little bit more faith. Maybe don't be so doom and gloom about them. <laughs> yeah, that's totally yeah. fair. Um, that's my. I can. I, I. I like the points you make. I think especially with the coaching staff, I think Paris could make a big splash early in the season. Um, I see Sparkle's kind of journey as potentially being very similar to Sinatra's, where his first year he may struggle, and but I think in twenty twenty one especially we could see him really come into his own, having had half a season with the team, kind of really to mesh in. I think. Parish are going for a similar strategy as the shock where maybe this isn't their year. Maybe. I mean, I, I think they'd be pleased if it was kind of like the shock were in 2018. I think they're looking maybe even ahead one more year when they have sparkle for sparkle for a full year, plus even more integration. We'll see. But I think, I think what you said, Kate is correct. I mean, I think anywhere from 14 to 18 is pretty fair for Paris. And, you know, I think 16 isn't too bad for them, honestly. So, um, Let's go ahead and jump forward, though. We're trucking right along here. We've just passed uh, our bottom five. We're on to now number 15, the Florida Mayhem. The new vice, Florida Mayhem. They definitely look the best in the league. Bradley, why do we have them at 15? Well, it, oh, you mean it's it's not just because of the, the rebrand? Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I, I think this is a, a pretty solid place for, for Florida all things considered given the the kind of promise that they showed towards the tail end of last season in stage four uh and the the additions that they've made in the off season in adding uh both gangnam jim and yaki who i think are are both it's kind of sleeper candidates for rookie of the year um yeah. Yeah. coming over from runaway i i i really highly rate those those two players 
uh, coming in as rookies. I I still have concerns just given the history of Florida and the fact that they've never been able to put it together as a, a franchise. You know, the 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 history suggests that they are not going to suddenly become contenders just with the those few moves. It's going to take yeah. uh, a little extended success for me to to fully buy into to Florida, but they are are definitely going to to be vastly better than they were last year. I think that's fair. Um, Mallory, Kate, any other additions to that? No, I agree. I think those two additions, while great, I just don't think that'll be game-changing for them just yet. Yeah. So. I, I think Florida's in a position where they're kind of like, I think of them similarly to like London and Seoul and maybe even Dallas, where there just needs to be a culture change within the organization. And that's a very like non-material thing to talk about. So I don't know how to like truly analyze how they go about fixing that. But I have similar feelings where I have about Dallas, where I just don't know that enough of the old guard came out. I don't know if like Chris and Byram, I think, are two players still on that roster. I don't know that they need to be around. I think Gargoyle's amazing. I think their new additions are amazing. I believe in the coaching staff more. Um, but yeah, I'm just I'm still a little hesitant to move forward with Florida as well for whatever reason. I don't know. It's hard to it's hard to put into words. They do have an easy travel schedule though. I think they're about third easiest in the league. Um, that Atlantic South, I think, is the division. A mm-hmm. um, lot of uh, a lot of good travel time on that that division. I think that's like Houston, um, Atlanta, Houston, Washington, Florida, Atlanta. Yeah, Houston, Florida, Atlanta, Washington, Philly. All yep. you know, it, it's the gap between them and the rest of the league in terms of the travel. It, it's pretty damn massive. Yeah, so that will be something to as we trek into this first year of traveling roadshow and seeing how the players and staff handle it. Florida could be kind of a sleeper team late in the year where they're just more rested and so they just their responsiveness is better on stage, hand eye works better, stuff like that. So we'll have to keep an eye on that for sure. Um, let's jump to the Toronto Defiant. Uh, I'm deeming this the new Houston Outlaws, uh, just the A1 marketable team only in Canada. Uh, Mallory, let's let's hear about the Defiant because you are are you their beat writer now? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Me, 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 and my boy uh, Brad, who's in the chat, are tag team in the the Defiant this yep. year. Nice. Um, I personally, in my rankings, I had Toronto a little higher. Um, but it's one of those things that Kate definitely said, where like ten to fifteen is just sort of a mix of interchangeable, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, teams that could just really go either way. Um, for the Defiant, I definitely think you're right, Connor. They're probably one of the most marketable teams right now. They basically just took everyone's fan favorites yeah. and just put them together. And it works because they're also all from Canada. So they took Agilities, they took Surefort, they have Mangachu. Like, the only one they were missing was Bonnie. Yeah. And you have you have Team Canada all wrapped up, nice, you know, nice and neat in Toronto. And then you bring Kariv with Agilities because they can't be separated. And you have Nevix, who got to show himself last year, and he, he you know, was pretty good. Um, a lot of the concerns are completely understandable. I think this team can either be, like, top 10 more towards the bottom, like a play-in top 10. Yeah. Or, like, um, I think Ethan, who's also in the chat, said this once. They're going to be, like, a probably above-average mediocre team. That's fair. They have they have <laughs> all the, you know, uh, they have all the in- right ingredients. They have, you know, the, the juice is going. But... What worries me, and I think what worries a lot of people, is looking at Team Canada's uh, performance in the World Cup. Oh boy, that was not good. For some reason, Agilities is playing Arisa. Why is that happening? Yeah. We don't know. So it's really just a guessing game. I have faith in them. I definitely think they're going to be better than well, what they did last year. Last year, they started really, really strong. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, it was just... Just totally dipped. Reverse just, Washington, it, yeah. It was bad. <laughs> and this year, I really think there is a chance for them to, like I said, literally above average mediocre team. The only complaint I have, and it's a very personal complaint, is that the second they brought Kellex on, they got rid of Neko. I yeah. just... <laughs> yeah, it's tough. Any response to that? Yeah, my, my problem with this team is, like, I, I look at their roster and I look at all the, the players individually. I'm like, none of these players are bad by any means but i look at them and i'm like who is the the star player on this team is it is it sure for 
is is it Nevix if he is somehow living up to the, the yeah. hype that kind of like built around him during his like mysterious bench season on San Francisco? Mm -hmm. I, I just I don't see who like the carry is on this team. They all just seem like very like solid to like average players across the board. It's just to me. The answer to that question is to me. <laughs> yes. Brad is correct. See? I told you. Yep. And also Roki. Within his name. Roki as well. Roki is also good. Yeah. Okay, you were gonna say something? Um, I just think I don't think they're gonna immediately look very good, but I feel like this is a team that'll find their groove kind of mid season and kind of start to kind of exceed expectations at that point. I feel like that's how it's gonna go for them. I think we're gonna see a little bit of struggle, but eventually I think they can get there. Yeah. I'm seeing some, you know, just some whispers of people having this team in their, like, bottom three. And I just don't see where that's coming from when you look at some of the other bottom teams in the league. I think you have to kind of play who's worse, and I don't think you can say Toronto's that bad. Honestly, I just don't yeah. see how you can get there. However, I, I, I have kind of a similar concern as Brad where I just don't see, like, a star player. I don't see an elite talent on this team outside of maybe Kariv or Surefor. Or, like you said, Brad, unless Nevix has just been, you know you know time chamber you know ready goku status i don't know um but yeah i it just seems like a like i guess like you said Mallory, a, a pretty good mediocre team it's tough to say yeah. any more about them um we have to move now to one of the fan favorite teams from last season the team that made goats bearable the chengdu hunters Brad, we have them at 13, um, right around, I think, where they were last year, maybe a little lower, maybe one or two spots lower than they finished yeah, the season. They, yeah, they, they finished right at 12 last year because they made the, the play-in tournament. Yep. And, you know, their, their place here represents not them kind of dropping off or, or getting worse in the offseason because I, I definitely think they've they've improved with the the pickups they've made but just kind of the rest of the league getting better around them I still think people are sleeping on Chengdu uh, given the the fact that they won or adding leave who like is legitimately should be one of the the most hyped prospects coming into the league this year he should be right up there uh with sparkle in terms of the the dps you know kind of rookies as, as people um kind of or as players people should be getting excited yeah, for yeah, in yeah. my mind and the the other thing that i think is underrated and it's underrated for a reason it's because their their players are coming from china and people just yeah. don't necessarily know them all that well but yep. the 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 pickups on the the support line grabbing uh molly and linksa from their academy team i think is are going to to actually be pretty impactful because their support line last year was probably the the yeah. weak link on this team yeah. and if the, if those players could come in and make an impact immediately then the the ceiling for the, the hunters goes way way up because they they've got talent everywhere else on the roster uh, as long as they can you know kind of come together once again like they did last year playing their their unique style which you know given the travel situation might be even more effective it's going to be harder yeah. for for enemy teams to like prepare for what Chengdu does yeah, Surefor made a good point on that note where he was talking about how he's curious if, if there will be a bigger divide between Eastern and Western teams because they won't be scrimming each other on the same server anymore. Um, you know, a Western team could come into Chengdu for a game and have no idea what's coming for them. I love the prospect of that. And I think, like you said, I think it does benefit Chengdu quite a bit. Um, but I'm the same way. I don't know how to rate this team either. I think Leave could come in and be very impactful. Um, it's hard to rate players from China because one of their competition potentially not being as strong as those in contenders Korea, but he's still, I think maybe an exception to that, uh, that statement where he, he is, I think qualified for the hype. So they will be an interesting team to watch. Um, our next Chinese team is a team that finished fourth in the rankings last year and made no changes yet. We have them at 12. And I think a lot of people have the Hangzhou Spark pretty low. I think they were fourth. It may have been fifth. Um, in any case, they won a lot of games last year. And it just seems like the rest of the, you know, the middle of the pack got a lot better. And I, I think Hangzhou, there's something about it. I talked about this in my personal power ranking stream as well. Again, it's an immaterial thing. I don't know how to describe it, but I perpetually underrate this team. 
in the playoffs last year. I thought they were going to be one of the first teams out. They ended up having some really good games and made a decent playoff run. I just don't know what it is. I just I don't get excited about their DPS, but Bozzi, like has an incredible Doomfist, clearly. like Multiple players remarked him being very difficult to deal with. So I don't know what it is about this team, but I think there's something about them that people just can't get hyped about. Any other thoughts on that? One thing you you said they didn't make any changes. I think they made one big I guess, big change. Yeah, bringing bring, bringing in coldest. Yeah, I, I think that is is actually going to be pretty impactful because if I if I had to pick like who was like the worst player on this team last year, it was probably Bebe. He wasn't bad by any means, but bringing in someone who could legitimately be like a a Jonak type of player, yeah, uh, in, in coldest, I think could could have a big impact on them. But you know, I, I I still kind of consider this to, to be a tough team to rank just because I they they overperformed last year, um, I would say. Yeah. Through, but you know, I, I I do think like twelve seems awful awful low. It uh, does. It, it it really seems like we are not giving Hangzhou enough credit for for what they've been able to accomplish up to this point. They they're always pretty consistently great, even if they aren't you know kind of lighting the league on fire. They they just manage to find wins, and you know that's that's valuable. Yeah. Any other thoughts, Kate Mallory, on the Hangzhou Spark before we jump into our eleventh seed? I would put Chengdu above the spark. I don't know. I'm with you, Connor. I'm just, I'm not really sold on them. Haven't really ever been. Um, I know y'all don't put a lot of stock in the Invitational that they did with the Shanghai Masters and stuff like that, but they looked bad. Yeah. Like, really, really bad. And it just, I don't know. For me, it's just like they didn't really make a lot of changes. And again, I don't like the whole, oh, this one player will change everything mindset. So for me, I have them fairly low in my personal. And I feel like for me this is a bit high but again sure. i don't know that's just me <laughs> it, they're a polarizing team there's there's been people yeah. who have ranked them i think around where they finished last season i've seen some people where they're close to their bottom five so it is tough i mean it, it, they're a tough team to rank and speaking of tough teams to rank um mallory i'm gonna let you talk about the houston outlaws <laughs> they're at 11 so what's what's up they have yeah what's up much like I think Toronto and teams like it, the Houston Outlaws are really hard to rank because we don't know what's going to happen. Out of all the teams that made changes during the offseason, I think I'm going to go with this bold statement and say Houston just made the most changes. And they made the boldest changes from the beginning. They were like, Harsha, ours. So Harsha's on the team. All right, cool. Then they finally actually start making changes to their roster roster. They have hydration. They have blase. They have Mecco. Yeah. They got Mecco. This is just, it's wild to me. So they have all the ingredients. Just don't know if they can mix it up correctly. I have faith. I have faith in Muma. I really do. I think people, there's a lot of people who overestimate Muma and there's a lot of people who underestimate Muma. I like to think I'm like right in the middle. I think Muma is a good main tank and I definitely think he's one of the better Orisas in the tank. He's been playing Orisa for a while. Same with like Monkey. So I think it can work. There's just a lot of things that I wish they had changed that they didn't if they were going as big as they went. You know, like I still have a lot of Hmm, about yeah. their support line. That's fair. So, I they definitely have the most room to improve. Um, you know, they made incredible strides with what they wanted to do, and they have such a dedicated fan base that I think either way, whoever's in Texas, they're all going to go see them, and they're going to cheer and scream and yell for them, which is great. They deserve that. Um, but it's just another one of those teams where it's like, we really don't know what's going to happen until they all get on that stage and we see it happen. Yeah. for ourselves I, sorry just to kind of expand no, no. i think that i think that'll having the home advantage is going to help their mindset a lot like they already had like a pretty big fan base out in la but now they're going to be home with like you know i wasn't at the dallas homestand but like i know texas sports because my entire family is from texas y you go big or you go home yeah, <laughs> like you intense. are for that team <laughs> it's going to be insane and i think that's going to give them probably a really big confidence boost which i think will help them a lot 
Yeah, I I just don't know what like the identity of this team is anymore. Like last year, for for all their faults and for for all the problems that they had, you knew kind of what the the team was about. And now, as they they incorporate the their three new Korean pickups, Mecco, Repel, Jexe, it, it's it's going to be interesting. You know how that shakes out. I, I like the the coaching pickups that they make, bringing over Harsha and. Who reg from Vancouver? Harsha has some experience uh, dealing with mixed rosters when he was with the Shock. I know he's been one of the Western coaches who has kind of uh, made a, a real effort to learn Korean and to to be able to to speak it. So that gives me some hope. But how the team actually fits together on the the stage is is just it's a complete unknown to me. They they've changed so much yeah. that it, it's it feels so difficult to, to project what this team is actually going to be. I completely agree. I think this team for me is all about the intangibles. I mean, flame has tweeted out. I think he has a good grasp of the situation. The overwatch league is in right now where he understands that the team needs depth and they have depth. They have incredible depth at just about every position, just about. Um, and, you know, I think the org, they finally have an org. They finally have backing. And so I think the team is in a better place at a macro level than they were the past two seasons. But I completely agree with you, Brad. I have no idea how this team mixes together or how they make all this work, but they clearly have the talent. So I think 11 is actually pretty fair for them. I've seen some people rank them lower, but I think I, I think they're, they're I think they do have a low floor if they just continue to implode and can't figure it out. Um, but I think their ceiling is high if they do. They're a very, so I think 10 makes sense. Um, and now we need to move on to the Washington Justice. Um, you know, the, the hot tub juice, I, you know, I'm collecting a few different people's rankings and for, for reasons. And no joke, this is the most agreed upon team outside of maybe the top three teams. Uh, as far as people's rankings, almost everyone has them at 10 or 11, and I can't figure it out. People are just like, you know, the 10 spot, Washington. Why not? And I think that's what we all did too. I think I personally have them at 10. Uh, I think a lot of people with this side I, think I do too. Yeah, they're 10, 10, or, I just 10 or 11, I think. Yeah. I, I think Washington. I have them at 9. Okay, okay. So like, yeah. Washington has inserted a chip. They have boomed our mentals into thinking that they're just a middle of the road team. And they're going to come out and just hustle us all. Because the last time this team was on stage, they went 6-1. and one. Granted, big picture, this was in an 8-win season. So yeah. they finished hot, but man, they sucked they during Ghosts. Out. Yeah, they sucked. They were really bad. Granted, this was during a... they don't a, have Ghosts anymore. Yes, and this was during a tumultuous time for the organization. They've made a ton of change of hands as far as top-level stuff to players. They've made a lot of good changes. Their offseason is still a little bit of a thonk for me as far as some of the pickups go. I'm not super sold on Roar. I don't know enough about Tuba. Um, it's just, this is a this is a difficult, difficult, difficult team to rank for me. But they have the easiest homestand schedule. They only travel 20,000 miles. They host five homestands, like 28 games or something. Uh, so, like I think they have a lot of things going for them that are going to maybe elevate them to beat teams where they otherwise may not be as good as. They'll just they'll just win some of those games straight up, I think. So that's my take on Washington. But I, th I think the biggest takeaway is that they've they've inserted a chip in everyone's brains to rate them 10 or 11. That's my analyst take for sure. No, no <laughs> doubt. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the travel schedule and the fact that they, they've got the most homestands of any team in the league because that alone has, is, is kind of what led me to bump them up a, a couple spots from what I probably would have done if we were still in LA and still dealing with our, our previous kind of schedules. I, I think that'll be worth a lot um, going into this season. Uh, but I still look at this team and I'm like, uh, if there's any team that I could be kind of like fantastically wrong about, it, it's this one. I, I, I see potential for them to continue to not be great. Um, I I don't know. I, yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit worried that people are overselling them based on stage four last year. It's fair. I think this team has a pretty low floor. Or not a, a pretty, uh, sorry, a pretty high floor, but also a very low ceiling. I think that's why people have them at 10. I don't think they have a, like a pop-off roster where you're like, dang, they're going to beat the shock when they go play them. 
but I don't think they're like chaotic as like the uprising or valiant were like ah oh, no they're they're bad like they're gonna lose a considerable amount of games so I think that's just where they end up for a lot of people um a team that I don't think is like that and I think has a lot more parity is the Guangzhou charge Kate talk us through we have them at nine on our rankings and people have had them as high as four and as low as kind of mid teens why nine do you think um I know Ethan is in the chat and Hello. he's mad at me right now um, because my personal rankings had them much, 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 much lower. You brought us down. Um, brought them down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I fully accept that this is going to be my uh, clown music, you know, end of the year thing. I'm going to be laughed at for that ranking. Um, but like now. I said earlier, like for me, like it's really hard. Five, like, I guess maybe eight through 15 is really hard for me to kind of place because you can make an argument for any team to be at a certain number but um the charge are you know they had a fairly good season last season for me they were just kind of inconsistent and then i'm not sure about a couple of the pickups that they've made because they dropped a lot of people they dropped uh rise hoppa uh fraggy bishu and only wish you know fraggy and bishu i was expecting but hoppa was kind of like the big one for me he like mm -hmm. Hoppa's Hoppa, like he's a damn good player. And for yeah. me, I feel like that's going to kind of take a toll for them a little bit. I'm not, I don't actually know a lot about Krong, but I do worry about that synergy between him and, um, I believe it's Rhea. It's not Rio. Rhea. 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 Rhea is Hongjo. Rhea yeah. is Hongjo. Sorry. It's, it's, yeah. it's no, you're good. You're good. And then. <laughs> As the Philly girl, I just, I don't understand the Neptuno signing whatsoever because they have a really good, solid support line. <laughs> like, yeah. for me, it's just, I have a lot of questions and not a lot of answers. And I know I'm going to be wrong. I know I'm going to be wrong, Ethan. I know. You're not, Kate. You're not going to be wrong. Them. Yeah, but I feel like this is valid for our overall all rankings. And I think that it's fair for them to be top 10. I just okay. am an enigma. I'm gonna I'm gonna try really quick to explain the Neptuno thing. Okay. Um, Please, because I, I I would love to hear this too. Uh, the 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 way <laughs> I see it is it is a replacement for for what Hot brought to the tank table in terms of leadership, in terms That's of fair. a veteran presence on this team, someone who has like been in the thick of really big games. Uh, in really big moments and to to me that's his role on this team is to kind of be that leadership figure now whether that that actually works out and, and plays out that way is to be determined but at least I, I i have to imagine that is kind of the the reasoning behind bringing in that too and i understand that but that boy is not a bench boy i don't think he will be no, I that's that's just what my only concern is. I don't know how he's gonna Yeah. How it, that's gonna work. It's gonna I'm be... very concerned about the personalities clashing and I'm very just concerned about that as a whole. Yeah. I think the He's a good player. Like he's the, Neptuno. Like, the subtle <laughs> I just worry. Hint of the personality thing I think could be an issue. Um yes. Neptuno even said on Sideshow Stream that he didn't get a lot of trials because people thought he was toxic. And you shouldn't say that about yourself on video. You should just not let yourself ever get labeled as that because I think that is something that was kind of going around is that Neptuno doesn't play well with others. I think he is a veteran and has been around the game for a very long time, can provide that if he understands that's what he's there to do. So and I hope... They could have just kept Fraggy. That would have been nice if too. If they wanted, yeah. you know, a fusion, you know, seniority. Yeah. I thought they were going to make Fraggy a coach or bring in someone like, you know, make Bonnie, like, like do that kind yeah. of move, not a player, but... It's interesting. I, I think a lot of people are putting a ton of stock in Nero's capability and Happy and Shu to just carry this team. Because I think those are three very skilled players. I think Eileen's also really good. And Rio gets underrated. Um, but I just... I, I don't know that I see the carry potential of those three being enough to elevate this team to like top five status. I think they just need more to kind of fill out the roster to give me confidence in them. Um, but again, maybe this is clown music time for all of us. I don't know. I, I also have them lower though, so me and Kate are dragging down the charge yeah. in these rankings. I'll, I'll, I'll legit buy a clown nose and wear it on Watch House if I'm wrong, which I know I will be, so okay. I'll do it. Excited. We will be holding you to that, <laughs> Kate. Um, and no one on the show is is uh, shaving their eyebrows for anything, so don't. no one ask in the chat. Not happening. <laughs> okay. <Absolutely not. laughs> uh, I'm going to throw it back to you for this one, Kate, because I know you're big on this team too. Um, the Gladiators are at eight. I think they had one of the best off seasons in the league. They, they did lose some players, some key cogs, but 
we have this team in eight. Kind of break it down for us, okay? Okay, so the Gladiators. Um, the losses that they had, I think, were, are more... While they are talent losses, they're more, or more personality losses, hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. The Gladiators still have their core, which is Big Goose and Shaz. That support Huge. duo is the backbone of that team. And I was about ready to lose my mind when I thought there was a possibility of losing either one of them or just them just leaving altogether. Um, we did lose Dpay, but he came back. <laughs> so we still have our great coach, who I think is one of the most underrated coaches in the league, yes. and I still don't understand why. But um, we also have some really good pickups, especially in concerns to our tank line, which makes me very excited. We have Space, who is Space, and we have OG, who's a very good Reinhardt, and then we have LH Cloudy. <sighs> I know Paris sucked. <laughs> Cloudy is a good tank. He's the redemption arc. Good on wrecking ball so i am very excited oh. for him to potentially um add more depth to that because i know that his wrecking ball is probably like one of the best in the league and he's gonna be able to take that role where og could be you know um yeah. reinhardt winston and then we have space who is just incredible yeah so the tank line issues that we've had i think are i don't want to jinx it by saying fix but i think it's a step towards getting better yeah and then our dps lineup uh, it ah. looks good. <laughs> it looks really, really good. Ooh, I don't know. I, if anyone can make any player, you know, kind of mold together and be good, it's deep pay. So I have faith That's in fair. that. That's fair. I have faith in that. Yeah, we need our rascal Bird Bird rings. <laughs> birding in the chat. Birding. Uh, any response to, to Kate's analysis of the gladiators mallory and brad i i just look at the the way overwatch is being played right now in terms of the the meta and i think dps is probably the most impactful position in the game for for once in the game a long time. time yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, it, it really hasn't ever been that case but i i truly believe that that right now especially with orissa kind of being the mainstay at main tank that that position is not necessarily you're you're at least it's still very impactful but you are not going to see as much kind of uh separation between the best main tanks and the worst main tanks as you okay. used to um whereas the the dps line i i think there's a lot of opportunity for the best players to really elevate their teams and the dps line on gladiators is just a big fat question mark right now yeah. uh it, the, we here's we mad underrated i mean like maybe it, it, that's that's definitely a possibility but i i just i'm not ready to buy in completely i, I mean i i'm happy with where we we wound up ranking them but if there if there's yeah. going to be something that kind of shoots gladiators in the, the foot this year it's it's going to be the dps line yeah i couldn't agree more i think if they just had one more signing at dps i'd be very happy um even if it's just another contenders player just something to slot in so you have more of a rotation or even just like bring in a specialist on one hero that is is in the meta ish right now um i would have loved to have seen someone like fissure or or visility get signed to this roster to kind of slot in as well um, I do think that's their biggest risk. I mean, we know the support line's solid. We have a lot of faith in the tank line being solid. Um, Kate, I think you've described that perfectly. Yeah, I, I just also forgot I, to mention they added a uh, face and curry shot yes, to the coaching team. Yes. So, uh, True. Their coaching is, is good. Their coaching is top tier. And, and Dpay goes to GM as well as being head coach now. So he has an even bigger role in the org, which I think is good. I think you want to put all your stock in Dpay. I think he is, a, he is someone you can do that with in this league. Um, so I just don't know. I, I would, if this team signs another DPS, they are in the top five conversation for me, but for now, I think eight is fair. Um, okay. Let's talk about another team that I would say these gladiators and soul had very good off seasons, but I don't think they were quite good enough to put them in this elevated tier. I think in both cases, Brad, you want to talk more about why we have them at seven? Yeah, I, I mean, I I think well, for starters, you you mean the the soul Spitfire? Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like they they go out and they they make the blockbuster move. Like they they one of the first things that we heard like the entire off season was Soul's got profit and gesture, and suddenly it's like Soul they're finally gonna like live up to their potential. They're gonna build the this Korean super team with with all of the the best yeah. players that they can go out and get, uh, and then they 
trade away Fleta. They let one of the the most like hyped contenders prospects in the the league in Glister go to to London as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't do much else in the, the offseason. They they picked up a Dosen last week, um, which I I think is a, a pretty solid choice for them. But I'm I'm I would one just be concerned about kind of importing the the culture from London last year, which I, yeah. I think we've established was kind of the the problem there. The individual talent is hard to question from all those players, but I wanted more out of this team. I wanted them yeah. to to round out this roster with a, a few more players. You know, a, a potentially like a new support given that they they let Jack say go. Uh, another DPS, oh, like a star DPS to pair alongside Profit, mm -hmm. and they had that. They had that in their hands. I know. And they and they just kind of decided Ugh. not to do it. And I mean, it probably had something to do with budget reasons. Yeah. But if budget was the problem, why did you even need to go out and get gesture? I, that's yeah. the 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 thing to me. Like, I, I don't think it was necessary. Point. Like Marvel was fantastic last year, yeah. especially towards the the tail end of the season. I thought he was really really good. And I just, I, it doesn't feel like they needed gesture. You could have spent that money on keeping Flutter in the team, and I would be so much happier with the the way they're off season. Yeah, out. yeah. If, if you give me Flutter and Jay Hong for gesture, I'm taking that all day. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I, I agree. This team's tough. Mallory or Kate? Do you guys have anything else on this? No. I I, I think that I don't know. It's. I think they risk importing the culture of malaise and, and passiveness during the regular season from London. I hope that does not happen. This team, I do want to talk a bit. I mean, they are living in Seoul, and they're the only they're only the only team to live in Korea. Which so they're for these Korean players. Finally, they get to go back home and like live in their country and not have to culture shift every day. I think that could be big for the mental of the lot of the team. Um, so I'm hoping like. People like Prophet Gesture and Bedosian don't have as many issues this year because they're just happier being in Seoul. You know, I hope that happens. Um, I love they keep Toby, but I agree. It just feels like they went for this Korean All Star team and then just stopped, and that was it. And they let some good players go. So it's like it's similar to Gladiators. I'm glad we have them next to each other in our rankings. Honestly, I think it's a good litmus of where they're at because they're both just like missing this piece, but they have some elite players. So it's it's a weird blend for them. Um, I'm so excited to talk about this next team. I'm going to go ahead and lead it off, and then I'm going to allow Brad to try and defend himself against the onslaught of hate that is coming his way. Okay. Bring it on. Okay, so the Vancouver Titans are at six. All right. This is, um, I think for some, some people would say this is low because they, they won the regular season last year, and they keep, you know, five or six of their, their grand finals players. I think this is stupid high for this team i think this team will be middle of the pack because of one player this is the only team i'll make an argument based on one player for and i'm already seeing i think i don't i don't actually have the stream open okay i'm glad we're split down the middle here i'm glad me and mallory are just gonna clown on vancouver right now because fissure they bring in fissure at main tank they cut both main tanks with tizzy and bumper um, I, I've heard rumors there were internal conflicts between Bumper and the rest of the team and just kind of some general angst overall, maybe between some of the players, potentially between the coaches. So I think there's just a lot of organizational strife potentially in this team. And then what do you do? You insert a player with notorious personality issues into that ecosystem that seems like it could be crumbling. And we expect success and we expect him to play the whole year. So I think... If you think, I think betting on Fissure to play a full year is less likely than him bowing out at some point. And if that's the case, you can't rank Vancouver very high. If you make the case that he's going to stay and it's, it's less likely that he leaves, then Vancouver should do better. And they, they have an, an unbelievable roster when they're all hitting on full cylinder. Um, I just don't think it's going to work. And uh, Mallory, I'm going to give you a chance to, to add on before we hear our enemies talk to us on the other side of the screen. 
Anything yeah, else? Enemy. Yeah. It's my wife, Connor. <laughs> I just, I just need to, to, to put it into Laban's terms. One, Connor's correct. Thank you. And two, I'm just gonna read um, what Jesse said in the chat and what Jesse said to quote a good friend of mine. They're gonna be number one for the first two thirds of the season that they have a main tank. <laughs> and to that I say. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. You heard it here first. Okay. Let's fan. let's hear let's hear. Brad is a former Vancouver beat writer. This team is very near and dear to him. Yep. What do you have to um, say for yourself? Okay, so uh, I'm just tr I'm struggling with where to to start with this one. I'll, let me say, I didn't particularly like the off season. I I, but I do think everyone is kind of overreacting when it comes. Y'all are to acting the like the. It's like exactly. Uh, I mean, it, everyone has has worked themselves into a tizzy, no pun intended, uh, over this signing. And uh, let me be clear: they they absolutely one hundred percent should have kept Tizzy on this roster. Yes. I I, I don't think you can walk into the season yeah. with Bumper and Fisher together on the team. That's that is asking for personality issues. Like you you're you're walking into a a trap at that point. Yep. I w I would have liked to see them them have a backup to Fisher because I I am very concerned about how reliable he is. So l l let's get that straight right off the bat. But they went twenty five and three <laughs> last year. It's amazing that the team that carried Bumper and Tizzy uh, can't carry yeah. Fisher. That's and, just mind yeah. blowing to me. <laughs> you can't carry a player you don't have. If he leaves, you can't carry him. Everyone is acting here acting like they're. Sad tizzy bumper, but during the season they were clowning on bumper, especially so freaking hard, saying that that team carried him. But oh, they can't carry Fisher. They can't carry the diva. When Hacksaw one is gonna beat him in a diva off. <laughs> Two, Fisher's a damn good tank. Like at least y'all have a good tank pickup. Yeah, I, I I don't get this. Like I I think you slot in Fisher into the the bumper slot and they play very similarly they require a lot of resources from the team and we know that vancouver is ready and able to do that that, that is how they want to play around their main tank and you know to at least stylistically i think it's it's going to work and you know it, i just i don't think it's fair to to come into the season operating under the assumption that one of their players is gonna like quit on that's the fair halfway that's through fair. The, the year i i can't like in good faith act like i know anything about fisher's mentality or, or you know what his mental state is coming into the year so i i can only like in good faith operate with the the assumption that he's going to be there and he's going to to play kind of to his talent level and if that happens i still think vancouver is probably the second best team in the league M maybe that that doesn't yeah. bear out um, maybe they, they do blow up spectacularly, but I, I just can't assume that that's going that's to fair. happen. That's fair. I think, and I think both, I think the point is you can make both cases. Um, I think, I think reasonably, I think you can make a case that like, we should think like they brought this guy on, he's committed to a full year. He's going to play the full year. I think there's also equally, you know, is possible of a claim to make is that he never has done that before he's actually never played a full season and so like maybe that happens too so it, it's just this i think what you said is correct brad i think vancouver if they hit on all cylinders and like things work out and fissure plays just the whole year and they like nothing happens i think this team could be top two top three maybe just win the regular season again maybe they just they, roll they shock be better than they could be better than they were last year like on paper if everything works out fissure is a better player than bumper or Tizzy. yeah i agree just straight up yep. i agree with that i just i have so i had this team at ninth in my rankings because i think they will be fourth or fifth for the first half of the year and fissure will be upset and he'll leave and then they'll go down to like 17th uh so i average that out at nine that might be just scolding hot. And if you're going to talk about a clown nose, maybe I'll be just wearing it hard at the end of the year. <laughs> I'll say this. If Fissure plays the full year, I will do a watch house show in full clown garb. <laughs> I will don the white, the white paint mask and a red nose and a, a wig. 
if they finish top five, <laughs> and I'll host an entire episode of Watch House as the clown that raid them at night. Clip it. Hot. Here we go. But anyway, I think I just love I love talking about teams like Vancouver and Dallas because it's so funny to hear how differently people think about them. Like it blows. Like it's so fun. I just love power rankings for that reason exactly. Because the next five are boring. Let's be real. Okay, everyone has the next five somewhere in their top seven. So, meh. It's just about where you put them. So, we have Fusion at five, which I think is yeah, close to where I would have them and others would. But, uh, Kate, this is your team. So, I'd be curious to hear what you think about the Fusion at five. I actually have them at five. Oh, wow. Look at uh, that. The Fusion, the lights of my life, the bane of my existence. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts about this team. It's fair. <laughs> um. One thing that I am happy with is that we do have a new coach, and it's one coach. It's not two that are co-coaching. We have KDG now. Yep. And we have also um, kept on Christopher, and we have also acquired Seta, and I am blanking on the other person right now, but I know there was another person. So coaching staff, I feel a lot better about this season than I did last season, because last year I was like, where'd Kirby go? And okay, I guess this is fine. It was not fine. Yeah. Um, the Fusion struggled a lot last year during the GOATS meta, and they continued to struggle uh, with uh, when we finally got DPS in. Yeah. Um, Carpe and Ikio were not to form because they were playing GOATS. And, um, you know, we didn't really make um, a lot of, like, significant changes other than Neptuno just because Elk, Kib, and Snillo weren't playing anyway. So, like, for me, the only big loss was Neptuno there. Mm-hmm. Um, but we did acquire Hisu. Alarm, Funny Astro, uh, Ivy, and Chipsa. And? And? Fury. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, Fury. It's hard Fury. to remember because it's so fucking massive, <laughs> but it is huge. Wait, wait, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fury is exciting? Yeah, what? Yeah, Fury is it exciting. Might be the biggest signing of the offseason. Okay. Fury's a game thing. changer. I, Chris Frack said this yesterday. A lot of people didn't think that we really needed him and i agree i don't think we really did but they saw the opportunity to take him and they did and so yeah fury's here cool yeah exciting i'm curious how that whole tank line's gonna work because we still have sato as our main tank and that is my main concern out of everything um he is a very good winston period um <laughs> his reinhardt is not good um i've you know his orissa is okay i wouldn't put it really up there <laughs> But um, his arrest is pretty good. Um, I just, I worry about it a lot. And from what I've seen on Poco streams, he's been playing Reinhardt a lot. And if he is our backup, uh, going to be our backup Ming tank, I have a lot of questions and concerns. And then I get doubly mad about the chips assigning because that's money that we could have put into a main tank like Tizzy. Yep. Um, out of everything, I'm most excited about the support line. I think this is the most stacked we've ever looked. Funny Astro is insane, and I'm super yeah. excited he's here. Alarm is, in my opinion, the best flex support in the league. <laughs> wow. Or he will be. I think he really Ooh. is going to be that contender to become that. He has Dang. a lot of talent, and people have been waiting for him to come into the league yeah. for quite some time. Yeah. And I think we lost Kate. We might have lost Kate. Unfortunate. Brad, I'll let you jump. I'll let you jump in then, Brad. Oh, I know you wanted to. After... Oh. Oh. You cut, you, cut out? you cut out for a yeah, bit, you but you can keep going where you were. After we I talked about that. support line. Yes. Okay. You're talking about um, alarm. Yeah. I was talking about alarm. Okay. I'm excited about our support line. I think that's our biggest strength, once again. Mm-hmm. Um, our DPS lineup, I'm excited about. I'm excited to see more of Ivy. I've yeah. heard really good things about him. Um, and our tank line is just, again, the big glaring issue. Yeah, it's, a, it's interesting. Okay. I don't even see it as an issue though like i it, you can criticize sato all you want like i think it's been a bit overblown i, I think that's one of those things where like the hive mind has kind of t- turned on sato and uh, people forget he was good in season one he only played you know the the tail end of the season but he was very good for them and i think he could be again but all they need out of sato is to be like an average main yeah. tank and the rest of the roster is good enough that they're they will live up to the, to their like top five billing as long as he can just be average. Yeah, my hope for Sato is that this is the best year he's had. I think the influx of Korean talent for this team should make him feel a bit more home and be able to communicate more frequently. 
I would have still liked to have seen another main tank signing. I think it's kind of like with the Gladiators with the DPS signing is my fusion with a main tank. If either of those teams make that move, they are immediately elevated to like another tier of a ranking for me, personally. Um, for me, it has to be Sato's year this year. Oh, it has to be. Or the, he has to be It cut. has to be his year yeah. this year. Because yeah. you can only make the argument for so long that, yes, the team likes him, and the, yes, the team likes working with him, which is what Chipsa was talking about yesterday um, yeah. on... Uh, Tactical crash. tripods. Thank you. I forgot the name of it for a second. Yeah. Um, he was talking about how like not a single player came in there saying we don't want to work with Sato. So like, he, there's something there. We just have not really seen it yet. And yeah. I really hope that this year is the year that he's able to prove himself. And I'll be happy if he does. But that is my big worry. And then I'm also worried about the lack of a second support for Funny Astro just because of illness. Yeah. Because that happened to us last year yep. with yep. Elk. That was his debut was when Boombox was sick and he had to go on to flex support. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we saw how that went. So I just worry about the lack of backups. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, but in any case, I think the Fusion being at top five is reasonable for us. Um, I've seen some people rank them as high as two. Um, and some other rankings I've seen and also some people rank them as low as like 12th. So... I think law of averages play out and we get them at five. That's fine. Um, the dragons are another one. We did these rankings. I need to put an asterisk next to this. We did these rankings before Fearless was signed. This was when they only had Stand One as their only main tank. And I think for a lot of people, that was holding them back. So there's potential that this team would have been ranked a little bit higher had we seen Fearless in the roster before then. But I don't know that it would have played a significant enough role to edge out any of the three ahead of this team. So for me, I love the signing of Fearless. I think that is the, it's, we've been talking about like these missing pieces for these teams and how this is kind of like a narrative for some of these teams. I think that was arguably the missing piece for Shanghai and they filled it spectacularly. I think that's exactly who you sign at main tank is Fearless. Um, their DPS is just amazing, I guess. I mean, unbelievable. So they're going to be very good at DPS. Their support line, I think, is is very good. Um, I think where Izyaki's been inconsistent, I think we have a buffer there now in place where if he has struggles like he has in the past with the Valiant, you know, he can sub out. He's not, like, locked into playing consistently. Um, but overall, I just think this is a, a good on-paper team. Um, we, we talked about this a little bit in the pre-show, though, how we can't decide as a, as a crew if this is a positive or negative, but they bring on Moon who was previously with the Valiant, who at this point notoriously told Custa he was too smart to play GOATS. And, you know, a lot of the players have kind of, you know, joked about that on Twitter since then. I don't know if there's a ton of ill will towards him, if that's like really serious, or to what degree he really did flop with the Valiant. But I don't know that Shanghai needed to make up a lot of changes at coaching. Um, it's, I thought they had a pretty good thing going last year when they were able to kind of usurp GOATS with triple DPS. So... It's a team that I think has made some really good moves. I have questions with the coaching staff now, but overall on paper, you can't deny this team looks good to me. I'm excited to see them this year. I think this could potentially be their year even. I personally have them at two, so wow. I'm just really excited to see what they can do. But again, we hadn't, I forgot about Moon, so that's my I know, we, we now. yeah, we, we kind of, yeah, a lot of us, we yeah. just kind of realized that. I don't know. One, one thing to, to note, they are going to be probably starting the season off without dm yeah that's a good point uh, yes who but... is uh you know back in korea with with illness issues they still have ding and they they still have fleta so that you know given where we are in the meta i, I don't think dm was necessarily going to to probably be their starter uh anyways i i probably would have guessed it would be ding and fleta no matter what but it's something to note. They don't have as as much depth in that uh, department as we, we kind of anticipated. Yeah. I think, I mean, with this team's elite DPS, they are very meta-proof. I mean, good night. If there's double sniper or double projectile, I think they have everything in place to just master anything as far mm -hmm. as DPS is concerned, which is very important right now. Um, yeah. Flood another is one of the biggest pickups of the entire offseason yes. to, to me. But that That is the perfect player to slot in beside ding and dm like he he just he completes their dps line and you know we 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 haven't seen him much but lip showed some some good signs yeah. at the that shanghai masters uh event so you know the, that's another potential kind of uh breakout performer for them yeah no doubt um at three we personally 
Um, on this list, I have Shanghai or uh, at the Atlanta Rain at three. Um, a lot of people toggle the NYXL and the Atlanta Rain between two and three. Um, it's tough. I mean, these are these are two very difficult teams to rank, honestly, and hard to compare um, because they're both very very good looking. Uh, Brad, you're wearing the shirt, so I figure you're the expert here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Tell us about the rain. Uh, to to me, whether the the rain can live up to these expectations is really going to come down uh, to their tank line. And if yeah. Gator and Hawk can come in uh, and immediately be kind of impact players, we saw good things from them. Obviously, with ATL Academy, they were up there as as like potentially the best tank duo in like all of Contenders last year. Uh, Gator performed well with his like brief stint during the the playoffs when they they brought him in you know during with his two way contract so there there's good signs there but the the big thing that that's coming out of this off season is the beefed up DPS line like uh, grabbing Edison I think is going to be one of the biggest signings of the the yeah. entire. Uh, free agency period that that dude is just a stud and you know this might be kind of controversial uh or, or out there but if i had to take like any two dps players on a roster throughout the league and that i just had to roll with two players i want edison and Erster. like it, yeah. you can argue that that maybe you know shanghai or new york or san francisco like has a better overall unit with their you know multitude of players yeah but if i it, like those two guys i think are, are just going to be fantastic next to each other yeah i think it's fair uh cater mallor anything else on this i'm just waiting to hear who the ne- new players are that they're adding true i mean they're still gonna be a good team regardless i'm just really curious to see how that's gonna play out i don't know how much it'll affect or not yeah, my guess is my my guesses right now are are Kodak and Fire. Yeah. Um, just given the 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 way things have kind of worked out in terms of moves and, and rumors at this point, that yeah. that, that would be my guess. But you know, uh, we'll we'll just find out eventually, I suppose. Danny, if you're in here, we're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this this team, at least organizationally, like I think Sefi has a similar understanding that like Flame and you know crusty do i think these are some people that really do fundamentally understand the league and the need for depth i mean they're fielding a 12-man roster intentionally for this reason you know in case something happens with a player at any role they can slot someone in and have success never have to miss a game whereas like you know you could chalk out you know maybe a game or two for one of these other teams for a sickness or just travel sluggishness atlanta they should be on every single week and they have the luxury of not traveling very much being in the atlantic south a lot of good things for Atlanta going into the season for sure. Uh, and I think the same can be said about New York. Um, you know, they have a, the, some, some, some turnover, but they bring a lot of this roster back and they've been very good in the past. So Mallory, I'd be curious what you think uh, this team's going to do it too this year. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in my personal rankings, I also had New York at number two. Um, last year, I felt like I was one of those people who was like constantly rooting for New York, even though they sort of fell off for the first time. And I think in a while, we haven't really ever seen them perform poorly, but something yeah. weird happened last year. Um, for the loss of Mecco, I think they definitely got a huge win with Hotba. Hotba is very, very good at this game and i think once he gets used to playing with all those people who've been playing together now for like three years i think it's just gonna fall into place i mean i don't they didn't really need to, they didn't really need to change that much and they didn't and i i don't really see a situation where that team minus mecca plus hotba does bad it just doesn't make sense to me i think they're gonna do great i have faith I shouldn't, as a Bostonian, have faith in a New York team, but I do. <laughs> it's fair. The fact that you do speaks volumes. But I, I think that's the big question, right? I think is it is it how key of a cog was Mecco to this team and how uh, how key was Pavane's coaching? I think those are the two questions that if answered and are fine and, you know, Bianca and Hotba can slot in and replace Neko or even do better than Mecco, this team should be second or third. If either of those things kind of have some issues, I could see this team sliding, but... Even if they slide, because I trust Hoppa so much, I think they would only slide to like five or six. So yep. this team should be in the play-ins. I don't think you could argue much about it. Um, 
puckets hosting their homestand. So, I mean, yeah. come on. How can you lose? I don't know. Uh, don't. You, don't, you can't. You can't. So, um, yeah, overall, I think this team made the, the right moves this offseason. It, it was a cost thing with Mecco. It had to have been. He just had to have requested too much money, and they, they couldn't do it. So, I think they were able to afford Hoppe and Bianca for what Mecco was asking, is my guess. Which, if that's true, and you start crunching those numbers, I think Mecco was asking for quite a bit, and I think got paid at Houston. So, we'll see. Who knows? Um, without further, further ado, we were closing in on an hour and 15 minutes here. So we need to wrap this up relatively soon, but we have the San Francisco shock at one. Um, I could stop talking right there and we can move on because <laughs> what else do you say? Like, I, I haven't, I haven't, I have yet to come across. I've talked, I've asked quite a few people around the league. I have yet to come across a single ranking that has shock anywhere but one. Anyway, I haven't seen a single one yet. So if anyone can. Throw me some rankings that have shock anymore, but one we can talk about it more. But it seems like the whole of the world agrees they're the best team in the league. Um, if I had to craft like a case against them, it would start with like what happened to London after 2018, where they came into 2019 with some malaise and kind of like didn't seem as motivated to win. I don't think the shock are those kind of players, and I don't think Krusty would allow that to happen. But I guess it could. I guess. And they lose 9K, and that's kind of a big deal. Uh, Mallory, you're raising your hand. Please. Ethan did not have the San Francisco shock at number one. He wanted no you to know No way. That. Oh, and I my. have hot takes. Wow. <laughs> that, even if you have them at two, I'm pretty surprised by the take. He put Nixel on top. Ethan, or... for those who don't know, Brunester is in the chat. He is one of the hosts of the show. So when he is on next, we will be doing a precursor grilling of him for this. Yeah, we're going to roast him. And we will all point at his camera and yell, shame. <laughs> that'll, be the, that'll be the opening segment of next week's show, so be sure to tune yeah, in. I love Hotbutt, too. You know this. That is, <laughs> Hotbutt cannot for, be the argument. A yeah. love for Hotbutt does not a number one team make. Because if that's your thing, then you can't be mad at me for where I put the charge. Because Hoppa was the entire key then. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, before we all just attack Ethan for his um, not putting shock at one, I think I think we should just uh, I think we should just move on because I think it's a, it's semi agreed at this point that they are ex incredibly good. Any two of their DPS could start in any match and be probably better than most other DPS in the league, no matter how you slice it. Their support line is, I would say, the best in the league, and I don't know that it's super close. Maybe Fusion is close. Maybe Rain is close. Vancouver, I actually, okay. I, I'll eat my words. Vancouver is very close, if not better, at support. Uh, I fully admit that. Um, and then their tank line is just ultra proven as well. You can't, you can't take anything away from Choi Hoban. Smurf has been amazing. Um, yeah, I think, I think Choi is like potentially the best player in the league. Yeah, he was, Choi is he born. was, he was insane last year, and you know, mm -hmm. I, I, there, there's absolutely no reason to think that Shock is gonna fall off this year. Like they, they they brought everybody of importance back, really. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it, this one was like the the easiest automatic slot them in at number yes. one. Yes, it's no, like everyone no, starts their rankings no this way, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, so that wraps up our our official kind of breaking down of our one through twenty. If you miss it, we're gonna have this on YouTube somewhere at some point soon. Um, we do want to before we we close the night out though. We have to each give one bold prediction, one hot take for the 2020 season, potentially looking at these rankings as a part of that. Um, well, my co-hosts think of theirs, I'm going to start mine off, and I'm going to say that, and this is Brad and Kate are going to love this. They're going to love it. I think the Vancouver Titans will be in a position at the at, – either a third of the way through the year or a midway point through the year, well, they'll have to sign multiple main tank players because Fissure will be completely AFK by, I'm going to say, seven games in. I think there's... And I think the most likely person they will sign will be Tizzy. I think Tizzy I, and Kaiser would get signed. I can see them bringing back Tizzy. Yeah, I mean, like, it, it, that. that's definitely a possibility. My hot take. 
because I, I don't think they're going to get signed elsewhere. I don't think they're gonna even. I don't think like, Kaiser's on a team, but I don't think Tizzy's going to be signed to another team. I don't think they would bring in Fact Fiction. I don't think they're <laughs> bringing back Buffer. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's my hot take. Um, Mallory, I know you're in the business of hot takes. <laughs> if you have one, if not, you don't have to go. We can just we can. Skip. My hot take is Fisher stays the whole season. Oh, that's a spicy take. Fair. That's a spicy take. It's a hot take. That's my hot take. <laughs> I just don't think so. Oh boy, I could say my hot take that I said off camera that made Kate choke. Which was um, Boston Valiant Finals in Korea. You <laughs> know. Come on. There is no hotter of a take. I, I no, can see. I can like, see. That's a hotter take, Paris Boston. Like, I don't know if I have a particularly spicy take. Um, no, not really. I mean, I just I just agree with Connor. Connor's spicy Thank take is Thank a you. pretty common spicy take. I just don't. I have no faith in Fisher, and uh, that's not going to change. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh I, I think I think I've got a pretty good one. Okay. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go with either the Valiant or the Spitfire make play ins. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love it. I can see the Spitfire. I'm glad it's those two. I'm glad we're just not saying Boston. No, <laughs> I'm glad we're not saying Boston. Boston will win the content creation team because of Jerry. Jerry has been a delight. Jerry's a content machine. Just let him do his thing. No, I like that though, Brad. I like the Valiant or Spitfire. I think we can reasonably, I, I hope we do too, because for the life of T2 and contenders, we need to see, the, the, the fans need to see the contenders players can come right into the league and succeed. So it would be good for the overall story. Um, Kate, besides Fisher staying for the full year, any other hot takes from you? I do like that one as a hot take. So I, I think it is a hot take or not, but I can see Dallas being 20. Ooh. I'm, not sure. I'm not sure if that's that, that hot, but I can just see them kind of crashing and burning entirely. So I think the floor like is, is there, honestly. <laughs> we, <Yeah>. have some, <laughs> we have some other hot takes in chat. We have Gladiator's bottom five. We have Chips, Sam, a, Chips a sees the stage exactly once. I like that. That's... Anthony was saying Gargoyle top eight player of the year and that's Yaki, Yaki rookie of the year. <laughs> Yeah, it's close. It's a pretty hot take. Love you, Anthony, but it's a little, like it's, cool. it's a little close. I love, I love Gargoyle. He's a good player. Yeah, I agree. I think he has potential. Um. Anyway, I think that'll wrap it up. We've been going for almost an hour and a half here, so we'll, we'll close things down. But um, thank you all so much for tuning in. This has been a really fun stream. Uh, preseason power rankings are always super goofy because we get to laugh at the end of the year when we're all wrong, and we get to all yeah. be wrong together. Um, yeah. Like I said, we will, so logistics, you know, our little announcement at the end of things here for what's ahead. We will not be live next week. I am moving. That's why I'm in an empty, just barren room here because we, I move in like three days. Uh, once we have a new, once we have a setup going, we will be back hopefully for a preseason show before the first week of games, like the Wednesday before. This Wednesday at 5 Eastern slot is going to be the time when you should get on and see if Watch House is happening, because it probably will be. Um, and just really quick, the heart of the show is, you know, those of us who were watching in 2018, we probably all watched Watchpoint, and we loved that show. Our midweek kind of check-in, what's happening with the Overwatch League, fun analysis, segments, goof, you know, but also some some good stuff. We want to, to do that and make it our own and, and provide fans of the League a place to come midweek to see other teams doing, check on the narratives of the League, that's really why this show exists. So we hope we can bring that to you week in, week out. Um, and so thank you for sticking around. And we will see you all in two weeks. And then again every week after that. Until the end of time. <laughs> all right. Thanks. See ya. Bye, everybody. Bye.